Hey, I'm Eric Rokich with fitnessbusinessinterviews.com, and today I am here with Nikki Anderson, one of the top female fitness pros in the biz and one super smart fitness entrepreneur. Now, Nikki's been in the industry for over 25 years. She's built an amazing business for herself. She's seen it all, she's been through it all, and she's here to share her experience and story of what it took to build a successful personal training business. So, Nikki, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Eric. Glad to be here. Okay, so let's a little background information. Tell me how you got started in the fitness industry. Um, wow, I got started in the industry back around uh, 1979. Um, I had just lost about 50 pounds and decided that I wanted to help others who perhaps were in my same boat, meaning that I was never athletic. Um, I never, you know, as far as nutrition, I never had any formal training with eating properly and such. So uh, after I lost my weight, um, I did it the old fashioned um, started riding a bike, being more active, and uh, then I decided to get a job um, at a place that was called Jim and Trim, which is no longer there, um, in Texas when I lived there. And uh, I worked there for uh, about two years, and I loved it. Loved inspiring people and working with people and um, watching them make positive changes for themselves. Were you there as a trainer? Uh, well, that's what they called us. Um, actually, I don't even think they called us trainers. I think we were called uh, fi uh Physical fitness instructors. Um, we basically had a 20-minute orientation on the equipment, mm -hmm. and we were uh, a physical fitness instructor. I remember teaching aerobics classes with no shoes on, and <laughs> um, yeah, it's crazy. But I, I worked there two years, and uh, after two years, I was one of the highest-grossing salespeople there. Yeah. Um, but they fired me because they said I spent way too much time with the customers and not enough time, uh, you know selling and I was one of their highest you know salespeople but back then as I even find today the customer service piece just wasn't there and they didn't get it so I swore one day I'd have my own facility and the focus would be on the customers and customer service were you actually certified to do any of the training or work with the people there or no no no, no I don't even think they had anything back yeah, then that's why I was asking I, I was curious we were all just winging it <laughs> okay yeah. so you would work there uh, after you had lost the weight, you had gone through that huge transformation yourself. Was this? Uh, were you in high school? Were you in college? Around what time was this in your life? Um, I was, gosh, I was at a transition. I went to school um, very young, so I graduated high school at seventeen. I was uh, drama, theater was okay. uh, my passion, so I was going to school at night, and uh, I was I was working during the day. Okay, and when you were there, were you one of the only women that was working there? Yes, I was. Yeah, I worked with all men. Um, and the really, the, if there's one really positive thing that I got out of my experience there was the gentleman that owned it um, was very into the motivational speaking, positive, you mm -hmm. know, thinking. And he turned me on to all of that, you know, PMA stuff and uh, great speaker, Zig Ziglar. And of course, I can't think of them all now, but that that really set the course for me and um, my attitude and how I approach things. So, you know, even though the job didn't perhaps end as I would have liked, I learned so much. And obviously, it, it you know, set the course for where I am today. So you were there for two years. They fired you. What, what was that? I shouldn't be laughing, but what was that process? No, like? no, like, it they, is pretty funny. <laughs> did they just I come up to you and be like, you're fired? Or did they give you even any reason as to well, why? They, they just, they called me into their office and, um, you know, they, they basically said, you know, we've, well, I, here's, I know exactly what happened. They hired another guy trainer. The guy was huge Okay. and um, he was all about sales and it was a good old boys group. And I, I think that they knew that I wanted the assistant manager position, which I think I was more than well qualified for. Um, so they brought this guy in and said that he was going to be taking the position as assistant manager and they really felt like they didn't need me any longer. So that was kind of the end of it. And I walked away. I was very bitter. Um, and so I, I, you know, followed at the time my, my theater pursuit and uh, did that. I came back to Chicago, which is actually where my roots are from, mm -hmm. um, to try and audition for Second City. But I met my husband and long story short, I did not continue that, that road, down that road. So, Okay, so you didn't continue down that road. What did you end up doing? Is that when you got into training on uh, your own? Yeah, well, uh, I, I got married. We mm -hmm. had kids right away. And, um, but I, it was interesting, Eric, because I remember talking to my husband and we both knew that we wanted kids and 
And I said, you know, maybe I'll get back into the fitness world. I just think that's a, you know, that would be a really good alternative for me, um, just based on the flexibility, not physically, but with mm-hmm. regard to my schedule. And I think that would be a really good thing. So uh, I, I knew that I was going to do that. I, in what capacity, I didn't know. But while I was home with the kids, I did a, a lot of writing. And so I wrote for children's magazines. Okay. And, uh, and that's what I did for probably... Well, uh, probably about eight years, and I was opening up a Publishers Weekly one day, and there was an article in there about personal training, and I went, "Oh my gosh, that's it!" It was like an epiphany, truly. You know, the skies opened up, the angels sang. I said, "That's exactly right. what I want to do," and from that day forward, I never looked back, and um, and I, I decided to go into uh, to personal training. Okay, so when you went into personal training, you were still writing. You were doing that full time. I was still writing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you go work for another gym or did you try to do things on your own? No, um, I did a lot of research and I ironically at that time, uh, my husband owns a drugstore and his sales rep um, was moved to Atlanta and became a personal trainer. And so I called her and I said, tell me, you know, and her actually her background was in the health sciences. So I said, tell me everything and more that, you know, I could possibly you know, need to know about becoming a personal trainer, what advice you would give me. And she was phenomenal. I mean, she just gave me so much advice, you know, get as much schooling as you possibly can, get a great certification, um, you know, just do all your homework, you know, mm-hmm. read everything you can about, you know, anatomy and phys and above and beyond what, you know, you'd, you'd learn in, you know, your study courses. So because I had four young kids, I just went online and uh, did some schooling online in anatomy and physiology and business management. Um, and then I got my degree in fitness management, so I knew that I wanted to, to do in-home personal training. Mm-hmm. I, the reason that I wanted to do that and why it just felt so right for me is because I was, my kids were young. I used to do you know the whole mommy kids day out thing. Right. So many women were doing horrifically unhealthy things to either lose weight or maintain their weight. And I just felt there wasn't a voice for these women. There wasn't anybody that, that they had a common denominator with. You know, they were reading about all the movie stars or, right. you know, all the fitness people that, that were able to do this, but not a real mom. So I felt like I was somebody that they could connect with. I felt uh, the fact that I cleaned my own house, cooked my own dinner, raised my own children, yet I still made time for exercise would be inspiring to them. And so that's what I did. And so the, for the very first year, I did, I found five prototypes. Mm-hmm. And I worked with them free, and it was. I would encourage if if someone can afford to do that, it was the the best learning year ever. What I did was, you know, all the paperwork that I had, I would run by them. I would get you know feedback every month. What did you like? What didn't you like? What would you like to see different? And they truly were five vastly different women. One was already athletic. One um, was a, a smoker and ate junk food. Another mm-hmm. one was a, an athlete in high school that gained about 30 pounds. So they were all very different and had very different reasons for, for wanting to work with me. So by the end of the year, I really, because I don't know about you, but the first time you know you work with somebody, and where I am now, 25 years later, I look yes. at that first client and I say, oh my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> You know, yeah. but it's it's like any new job. I mean, you go in and you think you know it all, but oh my gosh, there's so much to learn. I think especially as a personal trainer, mm-hmm. because it's such a one-on-one, um, you really have to be a great people person and learn about people, learn Absolutely. how to respond to people, learn how to listen to people, that that's what that first year really taught me. So it was invaluable. You can't learn that in school. <laughs> no, absolutely not. And so you had basically five people and it was you were surveying five people for a year and you didn't charge them this was all done for free right correct Mm -hmm. okay so you learned everything were you holding in the were you going to their house like individually were they coming to you were you doing it as a group yep no I was going to their home um my sister would come to my house she was one of mine um, and my toughest client, by the way. <laughs> yeah, usually a family usually is, right? <laughs> yeah, usually it is. Uh, so, but other than that, I would, I would go to their homes and, okay. you know, and, and that's the other thing. I mean, talk about, you know, training sometimes, you know, by the seat of your pants, you walk into their house, they tell you they have equipment mm-hmm. <laughs> and their equipment <laughs> consists of one pound dumbbells, three pound dumbbells oh, yeah. and a kickball. <laughs> oh, you're bringing back some memories right there. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> so at the end of this year, uh, what did you do with these ladies? Did you, you know, say, all right, you got to start paying me? Did they, did you help, did they help bring you in clients out? What was the next step for that? Um, well, the next step was 
you know, realizing that I was ready to, I felt like I was credible and that I could go out and I could really, you know, garner some new clients. Um, three of the five stayed on with me and started paying me. Okay. And, uh, and then I started doing, you know, the, the typical business stuff had my, well, actually during this time I had my business card design, my logo designed, my, uh, tagline, you know, all of my pricing. I had my stationery. You know, I tell trainers this all the time, you know, we're professionals and everything that you put together needs to be polished and professional. Absolutely. And so that's what I wanted to do. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard enough as a personal trainer, especially back then, people didn't take you seriously. They'd roll their eyes, oh, you're a personal trainer. So more than ever, I think we really need to establish ourselves as professionals in the field. And, you know, we do that through, you know, the materials we hand out and also every single session we, we go to. Okay, now how were you paying to get these materials prepared? I mean, you were still writing, so were you using the income from that you're making as writing to you know pay for some of this stuff? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, I had a little help. My husband helped me out a little bit, but I okay. was, you know, I was I was pretty budget conscious. I mean, I laid out a business plan and I had a budget and everything, so I I certainly wasn't winging it. Um, so you asked me, I mean, as much detail as you need to know, but I had a, a pretty solid business plan. And, um, and a budget and, you know, ran it by an accountant and said, hey, is this all feasible? And so I was, I was very, very focused on, on the business end of it. So you were absolutely prepared to just do this and make this I your was. thing? Yep, absolutely. Okay, so you had three of those five clients stay on. You were still doing in-home personal training. You had all your materials prepared. What were you doing to bring in more clients? So I... I live in, at the time, the community that I lived in was about 140,000. I was writing for a different newspaper at the time as a columnist, and I was very involved in my community. So I thought, I'm going to advertise in the newspaper. Surely I'll get, you know, tons of calls. <laughs> right. Um, and of course, if we knew then what we know now, it would be very different. So I put what I thought was a phenomenal ad in the paper and sat by the phone and it never rang. Mm. And it was about three months, and that's what I tell trainers. You know, you have to understand that if you go, you decide to go the advertising route or the the, you know, the um, newspaper route, that there has to be a sense of trust established there. You know, just because they see you in their nudes, they're not going to call you. I've actually had people come to my studio today that's, that pull out a, an ad from seven years ago saying, yeah. I've been meaning to call you. So, you know, you cannot just bet on that one area of, of you know, marketing. So, Again, I, I joined our Chamber of Commerce. I got involved okay. with that. I used to do lectures to different groups, Rotary, Lions Club. I mean, anybody that would have me, I'd do it free. Uh, and, and to me, I think meeting you, you know, people have this perceived idea of, you know, of, of what a personal trainer is. And I think when they meet you and realize you're just a, you know, a regular person, you're not this intimidating, yeah. you know, screaming human being that they go, wow. And I think just meeting you just takes it to a whole different level and and opens up that opportunity for them to say, wow, maybe this is something that, that I could do. And so involvement in the community, writing for a newspaper, and I was, that was, I was involved in my um, elementary. My kids were in elementary school too, so I got involved with the parents there, and I used to do brown bag lunches. I mean, you get very creative mm -hmm. if you want to and if you're passionate about what you do, and I was very passionate about it, so. One of the things you were doing, obviously, besides that, is you said you were going out, you're speaking, Rotary, Lions Club. Uh, I get this a lot. A lot of people were like, well, how do I find speaking engagements? I, I, so walk me through how you would get those and set those types of things up so you would you know, get in front of a ton of people and talk about what you did. I love that question because I get asked that all the time. And it's, it's, it's simple, but it's not. Um, usually in the newspaper, in your local newspaper, well, now you can go on, on Google and just look up local groups, your Rotary, your Lions Club, your Women's Club, your Men's Club, you know, be creative, a women, Christian Women's Club, Christian Men's Club, Glee Club, whatever it is that they all have speakers. Mm -hmm. And just go online and look it up. And then what you do is you find a contact number and I get an address. I'm still a believer in snail mail in some, you know, mm -hmm. arenas. And for this particular one, it's very impressive. Uh, so what I do is I put together a, a formal letter introducing myself and say, you know, I would love the opportunity to come speak. Know who your audience is. Don't just send out a generic letter to all of them because the audience is going to be different for each one. Mm -hmm. And then what I usually do is provide three topics for them. By doing that, they don't have to think about it. Right. And to me, that makes such a difference because 
they don't know what to come up with. So if you not only introduce yourself, give a little bit of background. Don't go on and on about credentials. They don't care. They're looking for a speaker and a topic that connects and resonates with them, and then they'll call you. Um, and the most important thing that I tell trainers is at the very bottom, say thank you for your consideration. Do keep in mind if you have a last minute cancellation, feel free to call me. And I bet that's how I got my first five gigs because <laughs> somebody yeah. canceled at the last minute and they called me and I said, I'll be there. And I was there. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things was to get out and talk because, as you know, you know, you can position yourself as an expert. It's the best way to get in front right. of a large group of people at the same time. I mean, there was even a point right. I... I would talk to anybody and everybody. I actually went to an Autobahn <laughs> society. Like all they cared about were birds. <laughs> I went and started hey. talking about health and fitness, and you know I was actually able to pull a few people out of that. So it's a great way to to go about it. And I figured I'd ask you about that. And uh, yeah, and you have to think about our audience too. I mean, our yeah. audience is everywhere. Yeah. You know, at the chess club, there's going to be people there. You know, the woman's reading. You know, a book group. You were doing that. You're doing a lot of public speaking and, and things like that. What, what type of presentations were you giving were you, you know, and how long were they? Yeah, it really depended on the group. Like I just did um, a rotary, a sunrise group, and it was 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. So I went, I had breakfast, I networked, so important, show up early, network, 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 mm -hmm. um, and then just wow them with a really, you know, personal, um, interactive presentation, you know, because that's, you are basically, you've got 20 or 30 minutes. Usually they don't go any longer than that right. um, because they have to do their business first and, and then they'll have you come speaker if they have a meal involved with their particular meeting. It's usually never longer than 30 minutes. Do you and try to got, close at the end of them or like? Okay. If I must confess, I am really, really bad about shameless self-promotion. Okay. So that... <laughs> It's like I have actually had people raise their hand and go, so where do you work? <laughs> and I mean, I'm great with helping, you know, I'm a, I always joke and say I'm an amazing consultant, but when it comes to myself, sometimes I'm a little weak mm -hmm. in, in plugging and promoting myself. But, you know, usually what I'll do is I'll have my business cards on the table. Right. Um, I usually give a raffle away, maybe a raffle or two away. And, you know, I always close it with something along the lines like there isn't anybody here that couldn't benefit from at least one personal training session, if nothing else, just to assess where you are and maybe get some assistance in where you can go from here. So if, you know, I don't know if that's quite closing it, but just leaving them with thinking, wow, I never really thought about that. I thought if you went to a personal trainer, it was like a lifetime commitment. Right. So if you okay. give them that opportunity to say it is for everybody, and I usually say everybody in here could benefit from visiting a personal trainer, even if it's once. And you said you, you give a raffle, so I'm taking you collect at least their contact information. Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then I'll send them like a letter if we're having a special or an email blast or something like that. Mm -hmm. What do you do once you leave there? Uh, do you follow up with the people that help organize it? Do you, mm -hmm. you know, just call them, say thank you? Do you send them thank you notes, anything like that? Yep. Um, I'm a big thank you note person. Typically for something like that, the only person that I will handwrite a thank you to is a person who was my contact that organized the whole thing. Right. Um, and then, you know, at, at, at this stage of the game, people know me. So it's, yeah. you know, it's it, they trust me to come in and, you know, they will call me at the last minute. But um, when you're starting out, you know, the more people that you can, you know, put your card in the mail mm -hmm. and send it to them, you know, and you even might want to say, you know, feel free to give me a call and, and come in for a consultation. You know, I, I'd be happy to do that for you. You know, that certainly wouldn't hurt. All right. So you were doing a lot of that advertising in the paper. Um, yeah. Was there anything else that you were doing early on to try and bring clients in? Yeah, um, I think just being really involved makes a difference. Yeah. I think sometimes people underestimate the value of that. But when you show a commitment to your community, it, there's a trust factor there. And I said that earlier, like with advertising, you know, there's there's that block. They see maybe this picture or and I always do put my picture in it because I want them to connect. I'm I'm my I'm brand of reality fitness. And I think it's important for trainers to be the brand of their business um, unless they have a much larger facility where they're really trying to get, you know, other trainers busy and active and such. Uh, but for me, I've always pretty much been the brand of my business. So. I think that was, for me, the best thing that I could have done is just gotten involved, wrote for the paper. I wrote for um, a newspaper called the Daily Herald. I did that for about six years. And then um, actually maybe five years because I didn't get paid for that. Wow. Okay. 
Okay. But it was a huge circulation. Uh, what I found, however, was that I got a lot of calls, mm -hmm. but they were all from far away. So after the fifth year, I wrote to them or I set up a meeting with my editor and I said, it's time for me to get paid because now I was getting paid very well for all my other freelance writing. Right. And they said no. And so I left. And ironically, the my paper here, the Naperville Sun, which is owned by Sun-Times Media, had just hired a new um, editor at mm -hmm. large. And he called me and I I got on with them and I've been with the Sun probably now eight years, which is beautiful because it's my local newspaper. So the ironic thing or the interesting thing is nobody ever took the place of me at the Daily Herald, which as a personal trainer, I remember seeing the person that wrote for the Daily Herald before me and as soon as I didn't see their picture there anymore, I called them and I said, Hey, did you guys lose your your writer? And they said, Yes. I said could I, you know, do it for you? And they said, sure. Okay, so, so. It's, it's as simple as that. So if someone was looking to write into, you know, publications, just call and ask. That's all, I, I tell everybody, all you can do is ask, and all they can say is no. But they can also say yes, so. Okay. So I take it that you knew the guy from the new newspaper because he called you to fill in that spot. Uh, my hunch is that he had probably met with people from the Chamber of Commerce. Okay. And my name came up at at some point because they were looking for a health and fitness writer. Were you getting paid for this as a freelancer or was this for free too? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Nope. This was, you know, you get to a certain point in your career and this is what I tell trainers. When are you going to start valuing yourself? Beginner. It's what I tell my kids. Do not expect that you're going to get paid what people that have been, you know, humping for 20 years yeah. that you're going to get paid. You have to pay your dues. Uh, and it's a new pay your dues and that means doing things that are free uh, that means maybe giving away you know some of your services from time to time but then when you've established yourself and you feel like you've reached that point that okay I've, I've done what I need to do and now it's time to value myself so that others will value me as well and now that yeah now that I write for that um, I, I don't accept anything that they don't pay me unless it's an organization like Rotary and yeah. my husband's a Rotarian, so you know I'm going to go and do that for free. I mean, obviously right. it's for a, a great reason. But if someone, you know, a, a client of mine were to say, "Hey, can you come speak to my office of 50?" I'd charge them. Okay. You know, I'd probably give them a deal, but I'd still charge them. You got to value yourself at some point in your career. Is there a defining moment or point that you realized that you valued yourself enough where you could start charging for this? Uh, I think when people start calling and saying, yeah, I, I, you know, like to start personal training, I, I want to work with Nikki Anderson or when people start calling for me as a resource and, you know, you've, I, I usually say three to five years is, is okay. your due paying time. Once you reach that three to five year, depending on how well you've positioned yourself, then I think it's, it's more than fair to say, okay, it's time to be compensated. Okay. Is it, the reason I ask that is because a lot of, a, you know, new trainers come in and they're, you know, they don't want to give anything away for free. They feel like they've already paid their dues. So I was looking to see what kind of time frame that you figure would be good to yeah. start doing that. And whether you're a college graduate or just somebody that came out of, you know, a certification, you you have to have that opportunity. I mean, especially, and I say this with all due respect because I was there, the younger you are, the more you really have to establish yourself. You have to learn the 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 best gift you can give yourself is time to learn about people because that's what's going to catapult your career because if you have wonderful interpersonal skills and you're great with your follow-up and you're always professional and you always just set that standard so high um, that's how you're going to build your business but if you are you know are walking out of there cocky and expecting that I'm the best trainer yeah. you no, you're there's 50 million of you out there <laughs> You know, it's the trainer who really is humble and understands the value of working hard, working smart, and eventually, you know, getting to the point where you say, okay, right. now it's time. Do you feel that you being a woman still that many years ago, maybe that held, you know, people didn't respect you as much or didn't look at you the way that oh, sure. you should have? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think I even see that now. You know, I've had of men come to me. Now, here's the beauty of our industry is that every trainer is unique yep. um, but I have had some men come to me and they've left because I I didn't push them as hard as they'd like to um, and I think they were looking for a guy and they ultimately ended up with a guy right. 
And you know what? And that's fine. I mean, that's what makes the world go round. I know my philosophy and I'm not willing to compromise what I do as a trainer just and it's not to see someone successful. That's not it at all. It's that I have my own way of eventually getting somebody there, but I'm all about education. So I take kind of the circuitous route to helping my clients get successful. Or there are other trainers that it's the shortcut. Here, take the supplements or take whatever this is. I'm going to kick your um, butt every time you, you come in to my studio. And But there's no logic or education behind it. They just kick their butt. And they're, you know, crying by the time they leave. They can't walk for a week and a half. That's just not my style. For others, if it works for you, God bless you. That's just not the way I work. So I've never compromised the way that I train. And because of that, I have I have the reputation that I do. People know what they're going to get when they come to me. Okay. And you knew pretty early on that what your style would be training? Sure. I think you do, you know. Um, I always tell trainers when they get out of school the best education, continuing education they can give themselves is to work at a health club. And the reason is that you have a wide diversity of clients because even though we think we know who we might want to work with, once you actually start training those people, that may change. So you have an opportunity for two years not only to learn about people, but also to learn about how the business is run. You know, maybe you'll find another area in fitness that you go, wow, I'd really love to be a manager someday, or I'd really love to be a Group X manager, or whatever it might be. And a health club really gives you that opportunity to see exactly what you want to do. So when students come to me right after school um, to apply for a job, I won't hire them. I'll say, go two years and work somewhere, and then you can come work for me. What about someone who wants to do their own business? Let's say they're right out of college or they got their degree and they're like, you know, I want to open my own business. Uh, would you recommend still working at the club? Yeah, I would. I, I think that, I mean, I was, what, I think 32 when I was finally certified. Yeah. And, oh, my gosh, I look back on some of my first training sessions, <laughs> you know, and I really studied hard. And I think I come by, you know, uh, interpersonal or social skills pretty naturally mm -hmm. but oh my gosh you have so much to learn and I see that with my young trainers coming in I just want to scoop them up and go don't worry it'll be okay you know you'll learn this but what they taught you in school and I think we could all agree whether you're a business major a psychology yeah. major whatever you are you know you learn the academic you don't learn the practical right and there's no better you know, education as far as practical than getting into the trenches and doing it. And I suppose you could do that with your own business. And there may be some, you know, kids that are really gifted and can get out and do that. Yeah. But I, just, even from a business perspective, working at a health club, you're going to learn so much. That's how I learned what I did want to do and what I didn't want to do as an owner of a facility. So. Okay. So you were doing the in-home personal training. How long were you doing that for? A couple years, five, six years? Uh, I did it from 93 till 98. Okay. At what point was it where you're like, all right, I'm kind of tired of the in-home personal <laughs> training. Let me let me do something else. Was there something that made you think like that? Absolutely. Uh, I had four kids. Um, they were, when I started my business, I think they were seven and under. Okay. And my husband and I were juggling. I got to a point where fortunately I was so busy that I was literally leaving my house at 4.30 in the morning. I would come home, maybe help get them off to school, go back out for my next client. Mind you, I was all over. I wasn't like just in my town. I was all over the place. And then I'd get them off to school. I'd work until 2.30. I had two of my kids in daycare. Then I'd schedule so I'd be home with them, go back out at 4.30, sometimes not get home till 8.30 or 9. And I, w I loved it. I mean, you know, I, I really loved what I did, but I'd look at my husband, I'd look at my kids and I'd go, I, I'm not, I'm of no use to anybody except yeah. my clients. And that's not the way that I wanted to be. Yeah. So um, there was a, a building downtown Naperville, which is where I live, Naperville, right outside of Chicago. And I live about a block and a half from downtown Naperville. And there was a building upstairs um, from what at the time was my husband's drugstore that was available. And it was just one little room and uh, I'll back up for a minute here. What I loved about in-home training based on the clients that I work with is that it's private and they're comfortable. I work with moms that are deconditioned, um, in some cases obese, and when they were home they had this sense of safety. So they were willing to, to do a lot more and to trust me with the exercises I would have them do. What happens when you get them in a gym environment, that all changes. Right. So what I wanted to create was that same kind of an atmosphere so I had private rooms. 
So when people came to my studio, it wasn't like a studio that you would think of, you know, 800 square feet where everybody's training new. It was a 15 by 15 private room. And so I had two of them when I started off. Okay. And um, I had hired another trainer at that time. And actually at that time I had two trainers working for me that were helping me do the in-home by then. Um, but I looked at the space and I said, I could walk to work. My kids can come down after school. Um, I'm close. And I decided to put a business plan together, go to a bank and say, what do you think? And fortunately the economy was really good then. Yeah. And they were willing to give me a loan, and I started up uh, started up the studio. And what did you do with your in-home clients that you had? Did you convince them to come to your new studio? No, you know it's really interesting. I really had to have faith because I had about twenty clients that I was training at the time, and what what they love about in-home training is the convenience. Of course. And I would say seventy percent of them lived more than two miles away, and we know the rule of thumb is that if people are going to come to a health club, it needs to be about a mile away. Yep. Um, but the average client, I would say, was probably about ten to twelve miles away. Wow. So when I opened up my studio, I think I had two follow me. That was it. So you but were kind I, of starting I over then. For that. Yeah, I budgeted for that, um, okay. and I had a good reputation with these people, so I knew if nothing else, they would refer people to me. And of course, you know, they tell, oh, yeah, I'll follow you, I'll follow you, if they didn't follow yeah, me. Yeah. Um, and it is what other, it is. You had other trainers doing some of the in-home training for you, so were they continuing yeah. to do that with those clients while you were at the studio? It was very, um, I wanted to just cut clean. I did in home for about two years after I opened my studio. Okay. But I really wanted to establish ourselves a studio training. I wanted to be done with the in home. So uh, they finished up and actually one ended up going back to school. One was a mom and her husband got transferred. So I lost them and really started to, it, it worked out perfectly. Um, so when I opened the studio, it was just me and I hired my best friend to work the front office. Okay. So. So yeah. you only had those two that had followed you. You were still doing some of the training, in-home training at yep. the same time. Yep. How were you, you know, you were kind of starting over with the studio. How were you getting people to come in the doors? Um, because I was still involved in the Chamber of Commerce, I did a huge open house. Um, I did, you know, a ribbon cutting, the whole thing. I had been really aggressive with advertising. I had budgeted a certain amount of money. At the time, we had cable television that was ridiculously affordable. Huh. So I made some killer commercials um, that were on cable. I mean, they were like a dollar and a quarter a spot. What? Yeah. Oh, it was crazy. <laughs> and I think what it was is they were new in town, and so they were looking for, you know, to get their business going. So, oh, my gosh. It was like a dollar, I think a dollar and a quarter, a dollar and a fifty. If you did, you had to commit to six months of Still. advertising. <laughs> That's oh, crazy. yeah. It's like that was a no-brainer for me. Yeah. Uh, so that was huge for us huge for us and I think I did cable TV for about four or five years um, and then the bottom fell out in 2001 but I'll, I'll back up but anyway yeah. so during that time um, still my involvement in the chamber still I won small business of the year in the service industry for Chamber of the Commerce I had a book published that year so I, everything was going very well for me I, I can't disclose the name because I know this is not going to stay between you and me, but I, someone had taken my name, uh, the name of my business, and I ended up settling and changing my name. Well, that brought a ton of notoriety because that was, um, it was, it wasn't national news, but it was all over the area, Chicago and everything. So that helped. I mean, it was like the stars aligned right. and my phone rang and I had, let's see, I moved in 98. By 2000, we were seeing about 150 people a day. I had eight trainers working for me. Nice. 150 people a week, not a day. That would be insane. Say, wow. Yeah, that little and studio, I had expanded, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had expanded from two rooms to six rooms because eventually everybody had moved out in that little office building that I was in. Okay. So I had expanded. That was just in two years. So that was incredible growth. Yeah. Um, and then in 2001, we know what happened. The bottom kind of fell out. And right. Lucent was a huge customer of mine, Lucent Technologies. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but yep. um, in 2001, they went defunct, and I lost 50% of my people. Wow. Was it a corporate contract with them, or was it just people um, that were? Just I mean, word of mouth. Word of mouth. Yeah. Okay. One of the things actually I actually want to cover, I haven't done this yet since you talked about a grand opening. With yeah. Your facility. There are people who are opening their own studios and facilities. 
Walk yep. me through that process of, you know, going through a grand opening and planning for it and just sure. kind of getting things set up and ready. To yeah, go. absolutely. So, I mean, this is a free opportunity for you. You can make this as big as you want. And it starts off by calling your chamber of commerce and, you know, if you're a member and saying, I'd like to set up a ribbon cutting. Uh, the beauty of, of being involved with your chamber of commerce is they're an advocate for you. So whatever they can do to make your business successful, they're going to help you do. So in my community, they do ribbon cuttings and they make announcements in the newspaper that are free. Um, they'll also put it up on their website, you know, ribbon cutting here. In conjunction with the ribbon cutting, I wanted to do an open house. So how I planned it was that we do the ribbon cutting about a half hour before my open house started. Big thing in front of my studio and people going, gosh, what's going on to obviously attract attention. But what I did was um, I had a local restaurant in town. I said, hey, I'm doing this grand opening. They donated food. I had uh, Starbucks across the way had donated coffee. Wow. And, or maybe it was Green Mountain at that time. Ooh, I got to give credit where credit's due. It was either Starbucks or Green Mountain. I can't remember. But they had donated coffee. Um, and then, of course, I just bought water. I had raffles. My whole staff was there. And we did this grand opening. We gave away sessions. We gave away tubes and, you know, fun things, pedometers. And I did press release. Press release. Don't forget those press releases. If you can't write, find somebody who can. And so I really timed it um, so that everything would come together. So on that day, we did the ribbon cutting followed by the open house. People came upstairs. They could sign up for these raffles. What happens when they sign up for raffles? Guess what? You have their email address. You have their phone number. So it's a great way um, to get that. And then my trainers would kind of give them a tour throughout the facility um, and then, you know, give them, you know, a 10% off their first personal training package when they leave. How long before the grand opening were you marketing and getting, you know, in contact with the chamber? Six to eight weeks. Six to eight weeks. Okay. Yeah. What were you doing besides the Chamber of Commerce to, you know, spread the word about the opening? Uh, well, newspaper advertising. Yeah. Um, remember I told you I had uh, cable? Yes, I had that too, yep. They, for like, it was a nominal fee for like $20. They put like a banner that said grand opening, whatever, you know, October 25th. Uh, so you get free advertising there. Um, I think that was about it. Just a lot. Of, oh, downtown, I'd pass out to some of the, the businesses downtown. I'd hand out flyers to them and say, hey, would you mind putting this up? And they're always very gracious. So that's why it's wonderful to build relationships with other businesses in your community. Describe the community, the demographic. Uh, is, there, is there, you know, disposable income there and not so much? Well, there used to be. <laughs> I think like everywhere else. Yeah. I mean, like I said, you know, we were very, very successful just because we did live in a, you know, white collar community. Um, average age was probably 45. I mean, which is like, bingo, that's my target market. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, we were, the building boom was just going crazy. Yeah. And so, so those, those were my clients. That's shifted now. You may want, might want to talk about that later. But back then, it was a beautiful time. And I was the only studio yeah. in downtown neighborhood two others that came and went within a year wow yeah so the importance of being so. first to market is always a big thing <laughs> yeah but you know what and but here's what I tell trainers too you can be brilliant at marketing you can be brilliant at branding and having the coolest studio and the best equipment and everything that you need but if you are a bad trainer and you have no yeah. customer service and no business savvy you and that's what happened to the other people they came into town the problem with our town is people come in and say, ooh, it's Naperville. I think we're the third wealthiest city in, in Illinois. Okay. So people come in and go, ooh, Naperville, cha-ching, cha-ching. Well, people are very discretionary now with their money. And if you don't deliver the value that they expect, they will be done with you. And I used to tell people that all the time. Just because people have money doesn't mean they're going to spend it on you. There was, a, there was a time before I moved into the building that I did that someone had approached me about a different location. And it was really top-notch first-class facility and what they were charging me was ridiculous per square foot and then I started thinking about my clients this is what I'd have to charge what would I have to deliver to make yeah. that money I'm not in Chicago and it's a very different demographic than if you live in the city of Chicago so I knew that that would be such a stupid move it might have looked good on paper to say where my address was right the end of the day it would have been a very bad business move and there were like three or four other personal training companies that there was you know whisperings ooh such and such coming in you better watch it. I go no trainer that has any business sense at all would pay that amount of money for that number of square feet and expect to stay in business there's no way right and, and, and this you, day, it's never happened 
you brought up a good point, you know, where people who have the money, you know, it's great and all, you know, oh, I can get a lot of clients to have money, but they also expect more. You, so. you absolutely, absolutely. You got to stand and deliver otherwise. you And especially those people with money because they're used to getting value. Yep. Expecting so, that bend over backwards service. You bet. You bet. And we do it. Yeah, Our clients come in, they get a bottle of water as soon as they come in the door. I always have a bowl of fresh fruit out. Nice. You know, you tell me where else they can go to a health club and get that. And some, some may, but for a small yeah. studio, that's not very common. Yeah, so you're touching on customer service. Obviously, back when you started out those two years when you were yeah. you know, doing the training, customer service obviously wasn't the biggest thing. How important is customer service for you in your business? I would guess that 70% of the lectures that I do for IDEA and URSA and ACSM are all about customer yeah. service because we are in the business of service. Yeah. And I think sometimes we forget that. We're personal trainers, yes, but it is all about service. And somewhere along the way, we, we've lost that. I mean, health clubs have the worst reputation yeah, of, yeah. Of, for customer service. I, one of my favorite sayings is we tend to turn away the exact customer we need to attract. And what's wrong with that picture? Our health clubs are growing by leaps and bounds, yet you know, obesity is still or inactivity is still around 68%. So clearly, we're not hitting the numbers and hitting that population. Why? because we have to service them differently and we're not doing it. We're servicing the people that just want to go somewhere that's relatively clean, have equipment, work out and leave and don't want to be bothered. That's it. Unfortunately, the money's made off the people who think they want to work out, go in, find that it's not what they think. They get suckered into signing up for something and every month their credit card's charged and they're too embarrassed to either stop it or right. they think they're going to go back. Right. And I tell my clients all the time when they call me, you pay for what you get. If you're not here, you don't pay. I don't want to make my money off of your your failure. Yeah, that's a good point. That's honest too. It's ethical. Obviously, you don't want to, you know, just take right. the money and hope people forget about that they're paying you on their credit Absolutely. card. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yep. tell me what happens. 2001, you lost 50 percent. You know, Lucent went out. You lost 50 percent of your your clients. Okay. What happened then? How did you recover from that? <sighs> It took me a long time. Um, I had to fire a bunch of people. Oh. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm sharing this because obviously this is going to go out to other business owners. The biggest mistake I made, Eric, was that when things were good, I took a back seat. I was mm -hmm. like sitting back, living large. You know, I was yeah. traveling and everything was great. And then the bottom fell out and I went, oh my gosh, I need to get back on top of my business. So I let, I had a personal training manager, I had an office manager, I had a front desk person, and then I had six trainers working for me. I was way overstaffed and spending way too much money on staff. So I let a lot of people go. Uh, I think today I still have three of the original people with me, which in our industry is pretty good. So yeah, that's, that's pretty good retention. Um, <laughs> years plus. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, at that point, said, okay. What do I need to do differently? The beauty of, of having your own business is that it's up to you whether you want to fail or succeed. And I knew I didn't mm -hmm. want to fail. So you get creative and you kind of go back to the roots because there's nothing like when you open your business for the first time, that excitement and that passion. And it's like, yeah. you'll do anything, you know, right. you don't turn anything down. You're just in it to win it. It's so great. So I kind of wanted to get that fire back in. So um, I, I came up with a, a weight management program called Real Life Weight Loss. And it was a great program for us. The downside of it was, in retrospect, it required way too many man hours. And what I wanted to do was I created this program for my facility and it was successful. And then I tried to go out and sell it to other health clubs. But health clubs run a lot differently than my little studio. So it wasn't successful out there, but it was successful in my studio. But as I started training more and getting busy, I found that the program was really not uh, the model was, was weak. So um, I kind of got out of it for a while and I was just training, you know, to build my business back up. So I went from training five clients a week back up to training 35 clients a week. Wow. And then I had, you know, four trainers working for me. And so that's all I was doing. I was just working a lot. I was lecturing a lot. I was okay. freelance writing a lot. I was really, really busy. Um, but the business built itself back up. 
not to where it was in 99. I mean, that was, that whole time was just, that was the dot-com period. People were throwing money at you. Yeah. I mean, truly, they really were. You know, oh, I'll buy 87 sessions. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was that crazy. Yeah. So, um, it, it will, I truly believe it, it won't be like that again. And I'm an, a huge optimist. I mean, there's no doubt my business can be successful. But to grow to that point where it was in 99, it, some serious stuff would have to happen. But, um, that being said, so I just, I worked really hard. I created this, this weight management program. The interesting thing was I fought ever advertising weight loss because I just, that's not who I was. I was about getting healthy and, you know, weight loss is a byproduct of living a healthy lifestyle. And that was always my push. Right. The minute that I started advertising weight loss, bling, you know, your phone starts ringing like crazy. Yeah. Oh, you guys do a weight loss program. So, yeah. um, but then, like I said, I kind of let it drop and I got out of it for a little bit, but when the the you know, other shoe dropped in 2008, I created a, a weight management or a weight loss program, six-week weight loss challenge, easy, low management required by me and my staff. It was, mm -hmm. it was brilliant, and That's if great. I may say so myself, <laughs> and it really brought in um, some great, great business for us. So every single month, we set up a orientation. The orientation brings people in and it's free and we just tell people about the program. I do, you know, a little PowerPoint presentation mm -hmm. and um, we find 80% of people sign up after the orientation. That's great. Yeah. And we usually have anywhere from 10 to 16 people that come in. Now, do so. you get them, is a program like, do you have people getting on for months? Are you having them buying session pack, like packages? How is that working for your nope. facility? I always say you start off small because if you start off small and you're really good at what you do, then you go big. <laughs> okay. So we start off with just six weeks. That's all it is. It's a six week weight loss program and we call it that. And uh, we have a nutrition program the first two weeks. We have one that we use, and then we change it every two weeks, which we have found to be really, really successful. I did a whole um, lecture uh, on this for URSA. And, um, and then we have a journal that we give them when they start so that they track it that way. We do an assessment when they start, an assessment when they finish. We have weekly motivational letters that we send them. Okay. And I would say it's working at about a 65% success rate, meaning that when we started back in October, people are still maintaining or have lost more weight, which is, I'm really proud of that. I think that's really good. Now, during that six weeks, are you still allowing other people to come in if they walk in and, and sign up for things, or is it closed off to everybody else? No, because here's the cool thing about the six-week weight loss program. You can start any time. All you need is a trainer. So it's not like you have to start with a group and end with a group or come okay. at a certain time. Basically, all it is is it's personal training structured. Okay. Now, have you decided or tried to go, you know, maybe a semi-private model, group training? Or are you sticking strictly with just more with this one-on-one? -on -one? From a financial standpoint, it makes a lot more sense to do partner training and small group training. Um, for obvious reasons. the We are known as a personal training studio, so that's really where we get the majority of our clients is they want personal training. We've done the classes. Um, it just doesn't do really, really well for us. Um, that's not what we're known for. We're really known as personal training. So we do partner training. It's probably 10% of our business. Small group classes is another 10%, but 80% of what we do is, is personal training. Okay, and... In terms of referrals, people will refer people into this. What type of incentives are you offering your clients to refer anybody? Being great at what we do, awesome. really. Yeah, we used to give away, you know, here if you give this to somebody, they get, we just stopped. You know, if we're great at what we do, why wouldn't you refer somebody to us? It's sort of like the same thing asking about testimonials. Yeah. Why would you be afraid to ask a client if they'd be kind enough to write something about your business? You know, if you're great at what you do and you, you're, you know, you, give them 100% every time they come through your door, it would be silly for them to say no unless they wanted, you know, anonymity. Right. But other than that, you know, you'd be surprised if you're, if you're great and you devote yourself to your clients, um, they'll do, they'll, they'll be loyal to you. Okay. So you're running the six week program. What happens at the end of the six weeks? Do you offer them another package? Do they usually come mm -hmm. to you and say, Hey, I want to sign up more. Or is there something you do to upsell them into longer term? Uh, I'd say 50% sign up again. Okay. And stay with us. I, 
I think they're usually, I'm finding that they're, well, no, we have people from October that are still with us okay, and still training. So, okay. and so you were continuously run them in those six week cycles. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Anything different that you're doing marketing wise now that you weren't doing maybe, you know, five or six years ago, you still doing newspaper ads, anything like that? Yeah, well, you know, I have younger trainers now working for me. So they're kind of looking at me, newspaper? Who reads the newspaper? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they're kind of getting me into, uh, well, we just started reading about Yelp. So okay. we asked our clients, oh, and here's a big tip, by the way. Don't have a contest amongst your trainers and say whoever can get the most people to write a review on Yelp wins because Yelp will take them and filter them. <laughs> So we did that with our trainers, and you just you can't do that. They won't because they'll think something's fishy. Yeah. Um, so what we did was, you know, we're doing Yelp. Uh, obviously, Facebook is is a big thing. Twitter is a big thing. Um, LinkedIn, I have found, is far better for me as a business owner doing business to business. That's how I get a lot of my freelance gigs and stuff like that. Okay. But to get new clients in, Facebook, Yelp. Um, you know, the Groupon thing doesn't work for my business. I did look into it to consider something like that. So, you know, we're exploring, you know, the, you know, social media and all of that is just growing at such a rapid yeah. rate that we're just trying to do our best to keep up with it and see what makes the most sense for our business. Okay. I just want to dive into one last section here. Uh, I'm okay. doing the series of interview with some amazing women in the industry. I want to talk about, uh, this, the other side of you being a woman, some of the struggles that you, uh, come across and coming up. So as, as a woman, in the industry you've been in for a while what were some of the biggest challenges that you had to deal with you know over the years coming up in the industry you know I, I I'm certain that I probably faced what a lot of other women in a male-dominated industry face you know yeah. it's being taken seriously I think that you have to work harder and work more honestly than you know other people uh, other guys may have to so even to get my first speaking gig, I, it's kind of interesting how I got it. It was um, some form that was being done down in Florida back in either 99 or 2000, I can't remember, and I got an invitation to it. It's all these guys. So I called up the planner and I said, there's not a single woman panelist. I go, look, I've owned my business for nine years. I think that there's probably some woman, women out there that would really want to hear from another woman mm -hmm. on how they, their work-life balance or how they got into this industry. And I said, and he said, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. You and, seem to get those. You just place a phone call and you're getting these jobs and gigs just like that. That's pretty cool. You know cool. what? I, if you don't ask, you'll never know. Absolutely. And all he could say was, you know, you're nuts, lady. No, thank you. Yeah. But I think he liked my chutzpah and he said, okay, you know, well, we'll give you a go and see what you got. So I did it and it was great. And I met a lot of, I think Phil Kaplan was there. Joe Cirillo, Joe yeah. Cirilli was there. Um, you know, and they were just kind of, you know, getting started. So I'm mean, not getting started, but they had probably been three or four years previous to me, you know, getting their name out there. So it was, it was quite fun for me to do that. And, um, but I would say the challenge of obviously raising a family, I'm very lucky. I have a husband who was amazing during that time and supported me in everything I do. So I, I empathize with single women that have family, you know, just, it, I think you really talk about multitasking, and I, I think as a woman, we're forced to do that more than, than men are. When you started, okay, and you said that there weren't any other trainers that you knew of, right, yeah. or at least in, in that in that business. When was it when you, like, you started to see more women coming into the fold? Probably when I went, when I went to my first conference in Chicago in the you know latter 1980s, 88, 89. Okay. But they were all Group X instructors, so even then, trainers, female trainers, were few and far between. Then, you know, I mean, even if you look at like the the personalities, then you know, like the, you know, the DVDs, they were all Group X instructors. They weren't right. personal trainers, so it was a little bit different. So I would probably say the mid early 90s is when I started meeting more female trainers. But even then, it was a small group. I mean, when I started lecturing, I think about business owners when I started lecturing back in yeah. 2000. I might have had four women to 50 or 60 men, and now it's 50-50 some, in some instances. When I do a women lecture, it's 90% women and 10% men. Right, so that's one of the biggest changes you've seen over time from you know, the women in the industry. Yeah, business, yeah. I'm, okay. I, and you know, a lot of these women are coming out of the Group X industry and becoming trainers and starting their own business. 
What would you like to see more of for, for the women in the industry? Wow, that's a really great question. Um, you know, I don't even know if I'd like to to s say just women, but what I'd like to see more of the industry, and I, I, in some terms I think it's going that way, is really kind of getting away from, in order to be a female trainer, I have to look a certain way. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I mean, I think that I need to ha be a solid representation of my industry and be healthy and fit. However, I don't think I need to be 5'9" and perfect measurements and walk around in clothing that shows the world what I'm, I'm built like. And I might be treading on thin water here, but I don't like that about my industry. I think that if I'm a great trainer at what I do, if I'm knowledgeable, if I have a great track record and I'm committed to the health and success of my client, I don't need any more than that. And I think women tend to be judged a little bit more harshly on that end of it. You know, I've heard other women go, God, she's a trainer? I, I don't, I mean, yeah. well, women can be a little nasty anyway, but <laughs> that's the part that I would really like to see as overcome, you know, tell me what's up here and tell me how you train. Cause I'll tell you what, I could see an amazingly hot female trainer that is a horrendous trainer. Um, and I see that with guys too, just because they're built doesn't equate to being a great trainer. Right. And I think in our industry, that's a really tough thing to get past. So I've always tried to really gloss over the fact that I think there is a certain prereq that you have to have physically in order to be involved in this. Yes, I, I think it's very important that you take care of yourself. I think if you don't, you know, then you should be called out on it. But I don't think we should be perfect. I think we should do the best that we can, no more or no less than what we ask our clients to do. Right, since the demographic that you know uses personal training are generally women, would you think that a woman trainer would have an advantage over a male trainer since most of the people they're training are female? Um, yes and no, and I'll, I'll tell you why I answer it that way, because I have women that come in and I will ask them, do you have a preference of a male or female trainer? And one of the biggest reasons people come to me is because of a female trainer. But what's really interesting is that a lot of men come in looking for a female trainer. They don't want a guy trainer. So I would say of the clients that come into our studio, 60 percent want a fee, 60 to 70 percent want a female trainer. If you look at just the women, 80 percent of them want a female trainer. 20 percent don't care. Of the men, they all want a female trainer. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I can understand, you know, being a guy. Okay, I have a female trainer, but I'd actually have to really dig into that to see why. That's actually a pretty interesting fact that you and, brought up. My reasoning behind the clients that we get is because they're deconditioned and they're, there's a fear factor there. What if, you, what if I'm with this guy and I look like a wimp? At least if I'm with a woman, she's going to be a little, you know, a little more forgiving than maybe a male trainer would be. That's my psychology behind it. Okay. You talked about you know, the industry going in a certain direction. How do you see the industry evolving for women in, uh, you know, in the future? Oh, it's huge. Um, I do so much consulting uh, with women business owners now, and they are smart and they are savvy and they're doing a brilliant job. I just met the most amazing woman. Um, I was actually teaching a TRX class, and she was one of my students. And she started a Pilates class 10 years ago, or a Pilates studio 10 years ago. Wow. Who heard of you? I mean, Pilates. Yeah, was, no, one, yeah. no one heard of it. And she's in a small town. She literally has a monopoly in her town. People come from all over. She now has her sister working there, her mom working there. Um, she's just, she was sharing numbers with me, and I was just blown away. I was so impressed with her business acumen and marketing. And she went to school, and her background was business. And she came out of school and right away got into that Pilates studio. Interesting. Yeah. So I'm seeing more and more women starting their own business and starting their own studios. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the last question on the, the topic of, of women in the industry, what do you think needs to change for women to gain more recognition and, and be noticed more for the accomplishments that they're doing? Um, I think it's to trust, again, to trust more in their business accomplishments and business potential versus, on, versus here. Um, we're, a very, we're a very visual business. And again, I get that, but I think if women would go out there and push who they are and what they do because they're great at it, um, then I think that that's going to level the playing field in our industry a little more. Very cool. Now I have just 
two more questions for you. I'm going to wrap okay. up. Uh, you've been doing this for a while. You've been successful at it. Obviously, you know, things weren't always the greatest at times. You had some struggles. So right. what are what are a few of like the biggest mistakes or learning experiences that you've had? Well, I think the one that I told you is that I took a back seat way too early in my business. Yeah. Um, I got cocky and mm -hmm. I thought that I didn't have to do anything anymore. And if there's one thing that every entrepreneur needs to understand is that you never take a back seat in your business. As long, you can you can work your angles differently. You know you can work on the business versus in the business if you want to, but you always need to have control of your business. So that was a, a mistake that I made. Um, I think at one point I was doing way too much um, single you know uh, focus marketing. You know just newspaper. And um, when after 2001, I needed to get back into doing multifaceted marketing, meaning getting involved in the community, speaking more, writing more. Um, joining more organizations in my community and just having my face out there a little bit more. Uh, so that's something that I think is really important. And um, taking time off is really important. Uh, we have a high burnout rate. There's a lot of psychology that's involved in our business and we don't realize that sometimes at the end of the day we're sucked dry. Yeah. So I always tell my trainers, for every 10 hours you train, one hour you need to do something completely unrelated to, to training and to our industry and just do something to take care of yourself. And that's not something that women are very good at. Oh, that's, that's a great great point. I actually have never heard that before. And uh, what do you think have been some of the keys to your success so far? Um, I just say very passionate about what I do. I'm very honest about what I do. And I think as long as you have passion and you're honest, you're going to have a, a decent reputation. I'm really happy doing what I do. I've been very, very blessed to, to, you know, how some people, you know, say, I wish I, you know, could find out what I want to do. Um, I even tell my kids, I didn't figure it out until I was, you know, 32 years old. And um, I feel very fortunate that I get to go to work each day, get paid for doing something that I really love doing. Awesome. So. Well, thank you. This has been an amazing session. I've learned so much from you. I want people to know more about what you're doing. So where can we find that information to see what you're doing? Great. Um, you can visit realityfitness.com. That's uh, my business website. Um, I also do a blog, uh, nikkianderson.com. Uh, and I also have a website for personal trainers called uh, Personal Trainer Professional. And so I blog on there as well. But also feel free to join me on Facebook and Twitter. Awesome. Well, Nikki, thank you so much. And I wish you the best of luck with everything in oh, the future. Thanks so much, Eric. I appreciate it. All right. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Oh, 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 oh,